I was born in 1974. That means I've only lived in a country where it was considered a right to murder a baby in the womb. Many of you who are older than I am have prayed longer, um, and many of you who have grown up since 1973 in the Supreme Court Roe versus Wade decision have prayed for the ending of abortions. And so uh, we rejoice in the Dobbs decision this week. It is a legal decision, um, and it's an answer to prayer, and we praise God for that. It, of course, does not end abortion in this country. One would hope that it would immediately. It does send the abortion decisions back to the states, and so it is incomplete in terms of being a, a full answer to the prayer of the crisis that has been abortion in this country. It means that now people will decide through legislatures what will happen in their various states. I think the concern that I have in thinking through um, sort of this hollow rejoicing I felt the last couple of days with the ending of Roe versus Wade, the overturning of it, is that it seems that half of our nation still believes that killing the unborn is a good thing, is to be protected, is to be fought for, rioted over uh, some sort of, of right, as if it, it should be held up as a right to... Uh, have gas chambers for the extermination of a race or, or to uphold people's rights to perpetrate European slave trade through chattel slavery here in America. Uh, there's an incompleteness in this that represents the hearts of the people in this country that is still a matter of concern to us who love the Lord. I read that Dick's Sporting Goods a retail sporting goods store is offering $4,000 for employees who still want to kill their babies and they're providing for them to go somewhere else to do it. Just a sporting goods store. This country still needs the gospel. So we can be glad and we can be sad simultaneously. Thumbs up for a legal decision. An answer to prayer, truly. And yet the revealing of a spiritual condition. So as we go to the, the Word of God today, we're just going to pray again for our nation and pray for soft hearts for ourselves and a readiness to meet spiritual needs around us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is good to come to you. It is good to gather together as your body of believers under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good to be surrendered to the authority and clarity of your Word. It is good to be together and think your thoughts after you. It's good to come to you in prayer. And we do pray, even as Jake thanked you earlier, for all of us collectively, that you have done a remarkable thing in our country through a legal process. We rejoice in that. And we know that you channel the hearts of kings like water in the palm of a hand. God, we pray that the hearts of Americans would be on display even as they think through this issue. Why does it feel like it should be a right protectable to murder the most vulnerable? I pray, God, that this would reveal the condition of, of hearts in new ways, that you would pave the way for gospel proclamation, that we, the beholders of truth, would go with light and love and compassion that we would be eager to meet pressing needs. That churches that love you and hold on to the truth all over this country would be fertile grounds for love and open arms and compassion for uh, women who have found themselves with child. And we pray that you would use this time, what a great time it is to believe the truth when the world can't figure out what the word even means. You are the way, the truth, and the life. It is you we worship. It is you we want to lift up. We pray even now as we come to your word that you would grant us eyes to see the things that are unseen so that we're not caught up with the temporal but with the eternal. We ask it in your name. Amen. 
Turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to continue our series this morning, Seeing with the Eyes of Heaven. This is part 3, and we'll be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Two weeks ago, we were looking at a camping analogy. We discovered in Paul's letter to the Corinthians that our life is like a tent, vulnerable, temporary, and it will be torn down. And we learned that for the Christian, home is not this temporary, flimsy, earthly existence. Home is heaven with the Lord. And we really harped on this camping analogy because it was right here in the text. And I recognize that camping is not for everyone. Amen. (laughs) My sister has a luggage tag on her suitcase that says, I love not camping. Have you ever been glamping? Do you know this word? It's glamour camping. Glamping. One glamping outfit promises you the unique experience of staying in beautiful, off-the-beaten-path locations while enjoying luxury accommodations. And it's true. You, you live in a tent or a treehouse or a yurt or a teepee or a cabin or an Airstream trailer... But these tents and trailers and tree houses are outfitted with running water, electricity, Wi-Fi, fixed furniture, real beds, soft, clean linens, heat and air conditioning, and a personal chef preparing for you five-star meals. You get to walk out the front door of your heated and air-conditioned yurt and see dramatic landscapes and wild animals. Yes, we learned that our life here on this earth is like a tent that will soon be torn down. But, you know, couldn't I make it a nice tent? (laughs) Could you imagine glamping on Mount Everest? If your goal is to summit the 29,029 feet that grows by a few millimeters every year, that is Mount Everest in the Himalayas, you would learn that you must arrive at base camp uh, just under 19,000 feet and then climb to four separate camps before making the final 10-hour push for the summit. Camp 1 is at 19,685 feet, and there are no permanent human settlements this high anywhere on the earth. Why is that? Because a lack of oxygen begins to break down the human body. And you go from base camp to camp 1 to camp 2 to camp 3 to camp 4 on your way to make that last push. Camp 4 is at 26,085 feet, and it is in what mountaineers call the death zone. The death zone is anything above 26,000 feet, and the level of oxygen in the air is so low that your body begins to break down. Without supplemental oxygen, few humans can survive above 26,000 feet for more than a few days. You are at down to 30% of your pulmonary capacity. That means the, the quantity of air that your lungs breathe in is only supplying 30% of the oxygen your body would normally get. And your heart pounds out of your chest even when you're at rest. At this altitude, you're no longer able to acclimatize. You can't get used to it. Your body and lungs can't get used to the low oxygen levels, and you are actually in the process of dying. Your goal, therefore, at Camp 3 or Camp 4 on Everest is singular. You're pushing to get to the summit and back as efficiently as possible. You're not looking to make your stay comfortable. You're not wasting energy dragging a luxury Airstream trailer up the south coal of Everest. That singular goal summiting and getting back down alive, streamlines your efforts down to the bare minimums, those labors that best aid your ascent and safe descent from the summit. Christian, what is your goal in life? In this temporary existence that will shortly be torn down, is your goal in this life to make your earthly stay as fun or as comfortable as possible? Are you glamping? Are you setting for yourself a fancy dinner on the Titanic or slow dancing in a burning room or building your dream home on a sheet of melting Antarctic sea ice? Now, if God sees fit to provide you with some nice things in this life or some enjoyable things to do, don't begrudge his kindness. He loves to do those things. He's a good God. He loves to give good gifts to his children. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, he gives us these things to enjoy. 
And so we're not talking this morning about what you happen to possess or the wonderful opportunities you get to participate in. But what we will be confronted this morning by God's word is the question, what is your goal in life? What are you aiming at? What priorities streamline your decision making? What aspirations inform your accumulation of accessories and amenities and luxuries in this life? Look down at your Bibles and read along with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul writes this, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We are in this section learning to see with the eyes of heaven. We are learning to garner an eternal perspective. That is to think about my very short life on this earth through the lens of eternity. And over the course of seven Sundays, we will have looked at seven areas that an eternal perspective radically alters. I've summed up these seven areas in seven words. They'll be on the screen for you. Afflictions, home, goal, motivation, people, business, and message. We learn from 1 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 about our afflictions. What are they? On the lever of eternity, they are light and momentary. Real burdensome afflictions become light and momentary when weighed in the balance of eternity and all of its glory. What did we learn about home two weeks ago? That home for the Christian is heaven. And this morning, we're going to look at our goal. And our goal simply is to please Christ. So this morning is part three, seeing with the eyes of heaven the Christian's goal. Sum it up this way, the Christian's goal in life is to please Christ because you want to, Christian, and because evaluation is coming. Let's look first at our desire. This is in verse 9. Why do we want to please Christ in this life? Why do we make it our ambition? Because we want to. Notice what Paul says. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. What was pleasing to the Apostle Paul was an aim to be pleasing to Christ. And this is bound up in Paul's word for ambition. I want you to see the connection between verses 9 and verse 8. Paul begins verse 9 with a therefore, and you need to look back up to what he says in verse 8. We are of good courage, Paul says, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. And that was sort of a, a test for our hearts, wasn't it? To, to think about, well, do, do I really prefer that? Would, would I really prefer to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? That was Paul's perspective, and that is reflective of a proper Christian perspective. And so to prefer to be at home with the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to drive us to desire to be pleasing to Him. If you're a hunter and you're hunting birds and you have a bird dog, your bird dog wants to do what the owner has trained the dog to do. To find the bird, to not eat the bird, to bring the bird back to the hunter gently, and to wag his tail the whole way. The dog wants to be pleasing to the master. He knows he will see the master soon, and he wants to please. That is a Christian perspective. We, we prefer to be home. Heaven is home because that's where Jesus is. We want to be with him. We would rather be there with him than here. And yet we will be here as long as Jesus wants us to be here for his perfect purposes. But we know that we will see him. And so when we see him, we want to be pleasing to him. And Paul says, so we make it our ambition. And ambition here is the idea of aspiring to something. Is that me popping things? Probably. Sorry about that. To consider it an honor to do something. And this was used in Greco-Roman culture to sort of give this noble sense of, I want to do something for the state or for the public. I want to be a contributor. That was the idea behind the word ambition. 
It often meant rendering special service to the empire. It meant being a good citizen. But in Roman culture, this idea of ambition also came with recognition, fame, and honor. In fact, there was something known in Roman culture as the race for honor. It was something like a competition to get your name placed on monuments and plaques, to have fountains built. In fact, in Roman culture, you would trade money for recognition. Sometimes we think that money is our status symbol, or the the car you could buy with money is the status symbol, or the clothes you wear is the status symbol. In Roman culture, they would trade all of that. They would trade vast sums of inheritances just so that they could build something in the public square that said, this was built by Smedley. And they would give all these honorific titles. And the more titles you could give, the higher up you were on the echelon of, of Roman culture and status and fame. And Roman culture considered this a virtue. The, the kind of pride that said, I want everybody to know my name. I want everybody to remember me. I want everybody to rejoice in my accomplishments. And so you would trade sacrifice of self for esteem of self. Yeah, I'm I'm willing to, to throw over a lot of money so that the public can enjoy this fountain as long as they know that it came from me. It was the purchase of pride. To trade money for honor, to have a status symbol. This was transparent ambition for name recognition. And to us, honor sounds like a virtue, it sounds noble, but this race for honor in Roman culture was a competition for personal esteem. And so Roman politicians would work both sides of an issue. They would want to win approval to get power, they would even trample other people in order to get popularity, and they didn't care what side of truth they were on. Whatever side they needed to be on to have a name, to have influence, they would go to any length for selfish ends of having their name tied to greatness in the eyes of others. And they would work hard, spend their whole lives laboring for it, spend all their money to get it. And this is closer to the kind of thing we think about with the word ambition in our own day. It tends to have a negative connotation. But Paul has something much more positive in view here. It's akin to what he says in Romans 15, 20. I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where no one else has, where it is not yet known. Or 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, Paul encouraged the Thessalonian believers to make it their ambition to attend to their own business, to work with their own hands, and not be lazy. That is a positive application of this strong desire to do something, to consider it a a personal honor to do something, except both of these things that Paul uses ambition for are self-emptying things, not self-aggrandizing efforts. You see, working with your own hands when nobody would see it, working at a a non-lazy, God-honoring, biblical work ethic as worship, Paul tells the Thessalonian believers, make that your ambition, that's not plaque-worthy. You don't build a monument for a guy that quietly goes about his business when no one notices. And nobody was cheering Paul on or giving him earthly props in the outward expansion of his apostolic ministry. What happened to Paul every time he went somewhere new with the gospel? He got beat up, run out of town, chased around uh, by the, the Judaizers. He was in danger from his own countrymen. He was in danger from the Gentiles. He was in danger from rivers and robbers and the whole other list in 2 Corinthians 11. Do I need to not wave my arm? Is that what's going on? Okay, let's just try to fix this. Okay, now you're going to know that I didn't iron the back of my shirt. So sorry. Shortcuts, they never pay off. Where did Paul's ambition to take the gospel outward leave him? Despised, alone, misunderstood, ridiculed, beaten up. And he did not seek the applause of men for the agonies and labors and the heartache. Notice how Paul states his own ambition here. He says, we. Therefore, we have as our ambition. And he's either speaking of himself in the plural, or he's speaking of himself and his ministry associates. I think that's probably more likely. 
But I think also Paul is intending, at least by implication and by example, to include his readers, the Corinthian Christians, and of course his readers today, us. He's saying, in effect, this is how Christians ought to think. The Corinthian believers were looking at Paul merely by externals. Paul is unearthing their carnal view. And he's saying, this is my ambition. And the implication of that is, Corinthian believers, this is how you need to think about your own lives too. And the implication for us is, this is how we ought to think as believers. To have as our ambition to be pleasing to Christ. To have as our happy honor to make Christ happy. It's our happy honor to do this. We want to. Listen to 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, we are children of God, and we will see Him, and everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself, just as Jesus is pure. You see, thinking forward to what it means to meet Christ, to see Christ, to be in His presence, and to be conformed finally and fully into His image motivates us, fuels us to purify ourselves, to be pleasing to Him in every respect. And you know, Christian, that you will see Jesus, and so you live now to please Him. And that causes us to ask the question, will will Jesus approve of what I'm doing right now? Will Jesus approve of why I'm doing it, how I'm doing it? You just see, to have your ambition to please Christ means to have your happy honor to do what makes Christ happy, and He sees the heart. He sees the motives. He sees the secret things. And our desire is to make Him happy. I was in a trivia quiz contest in high school, and there were four students from competing schools lined up on the stage, and you had a buzzer, and a panel of judges would ask you various questions. And there were science questions, and math questions, and entertainment questions. It was kind of like Jeopardy, but you didn't have to ask it in the form of a question. And, and the judges asked some question that nobody knew the answer to. I think my dad knew the answer. He was in the, office. He was in the audience. I didn't know the answer. They were asking for the name of some dog from some ancient TV show that I had never seen. And my dad and I had this running inside joke. So I buzzed in and I gave what I knew was the wrong answer, but I gave it confidently. What was the name of the dog on such and such or whatever? Spot. Of course, it was a wrong answer. Everybody looked at me like, what are you, why are you giving wrong answers? That's, that's silly. And you sounded so sure of yourself. I didn't mind that nobody understood. My dad got the inside joke. I didn't care what other people thought of me at that moment. My dad's big beaming smile was enough for me. Paul wanted the Corinthians to know that his great big goal in life was, and theirs should be as well, to please Christ. And the world doesn't get it. And notice what he says. If we make this our ambition, whether at home or absent... To be at home is to be in a familiar place with your people. To be absent is to be away from. And, and the metaphor of at home and absent switches in this passage a number of times. Sometimes at home here in this tent and absent from this body means present with the Lord. Sometimes home is in heaven and that means being absent from here. And so the analogy goes both ways. I think in verse 9, Paul has in mind that at home in verse 9 is heaven. And absent from home is still here in this present life. And that's because the nearest reference is in verse 8. He says, I prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we have as our ambition at home or absent from home. I think Paul is linking verse 9 to the end of verse 8. Either way, the illustration works both ways. Whether we're in heaven or whether you're still in this present life, Our ambition, our happy honor, what we want to do is to please the Lord. And listen, you will do that perfectly in heaven without fail and without flaw. You will not be able to displease the Lord when you get home. And so we look forward to that. That's something to strive after. And yet it is our ambition to be pleasing to the Lord here before we get home. 
in this earthly existence. You heard Omri teaching this morning about our mixed condition and, and that there are even benefits to God leaving us here while we still have the residue of our depravity. God has things in mind for all of that, and we want to be pleasing to Him in it. That's our ambition in this life. And notice we don't get to make the choice. This isn't our decision when or how we go to be with Him. What is our ambition? Simply to labor to please Him as long as God intends while we are here. One commentator on Paul's life said this, During his present life, Paul aims so to act both now and hereafter, he will be pleasing to the Lord. And that's an imitable aim. We are to follow Paul's example. And Christian, your labor for Christ, your love for Him from the heart working out in your life, much of that is stuff the world will never see. And if they could see it, they wouldn't understand it. But the Lord knows. Heaven sees. But what the world would never applaud, heaven rejoices in. Number two this morning, the Christian's goal in life is to please Christ, not only because we want to, but also because evaluation is coming. Evaluation is coming. Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. R.C. Sproul said it this way, right now counts forever. This verse begins with a four. It's an explanation of our ambition from verse nine. And the explanation is simple. Every human being will meet Christ personally one day and will give account for his life. Hebrews 9.27 tells us it's appointed for men to die once and then to face judgment. It was about a year ago, in May of last year, a man in Spain was swallowed by a dinosaur. A stegosaurus, to be precise. It was a um, statue of a stegosaurus. A father and a son found the body of the man in the stegosaurus statue and alerted authorities. Apparently, the man had dropped his cell phone into the dinosaur through the mouth, crawled into the mouth to try to retrieve the phone. He got stuck in the leg of the stegosaurus statue and never made it out. I suppose I could have looked up a lot of different tragic and terrible ways to leave this world. The point I want to make is you don't know when or how. You never know when or how you will go to meet Christ, but you will. And this passage here is directed to believers in Christ. We'll talk to believers from another passage in a few moments. But notice what Paul says to Christians. For we, that is we Christians, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We all. Paul, the Corinthian believers... All Christians from all times, you and me, all who are in Christ, and must appear. That is, this is inevitable, and appearing here is to be manifested. That is, to be made known, to be presented and exposed. That is, the real you, with all the external trappings dropped, the real hidden self shown publicly before Christ, presented before Him. We are all headed there. Have you ever been really excited to see someone? Only to realize that when you get there, you have disappointed them. What will it be like to appear before the judgment seat of Christ? Judgment seat here is a Greek word, bema. This is where theologians derive the word for the bema seat, judgment of Christ. The bema was a step leading up to a platform. Eventually, the seat on the top of the platform took the name bema, and then the judge on the seat held the name, and the judgments rendered from that seat were called bema judgments. And so the bema came to refer to a, an official proceeding of evaluation. Jesus was said to stand before Pilate at a bema seat in Matthew 27, and Paul before Gallio at a bema judgment in Acts 18. And you and I have an appointment with the judge of all men, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom the Father has appointed, John chapter 5, to judge all men. And you will be revealed. 
and your life will be scrutinized. We must live now to please Christ because an evaluation is coming. Will Jesus be pleased? Look at the so that in verse 10. So that each one may be recompensed. That is, paid back, given what is owed or a return on investment for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The deeds in the body means what you did in this life. It's not arbitrary. There's not some guessing game. There's not a grading on the curve in heaven. This associates every individual person with his or her specific deeds done in this life. And this recompense is true and it is accurate accounting. There are no fudged numbers in this evaluation. And notice in verse 10, it includes all of us, each one of us who are in Christ, and all of our works, each one of them assessed, assessed and evaluated by the one who has been everywhere, he has been every when, he has seen everything, and he knows the hidden recesses of the heart that no one else could have access to. So there can be no hiding behind others, no riding on the coattails of others' achievements, no blending into the crowd, no credit for good associations. This evaluation is not a general picture of a sort of good life, but each person, each deed, evaluated. And these are not merely outward actions. It certainly includes those, but Jesus is evaluating here motives and thoughts and hypocrisies. And this is overwhelmingly a negative and a positive evaluation. We need to hear both of those. God sees through the outward appearance and looks on the heart. He knows when a good deed has been motivated by avarice or pride. It has been orchestrated in manipulation or done out of fear of man or love of praise. But on the positive side of things, God also sees and rewards what is genuine. What is produced by His Spirit in the life of the believer. What is unmistakable, supernatural, God-wrought obedience things that no one else would see, no one else would know. Secret prayer. The true worship of God through a solid work ethic in the workplace, unnoticed, unappreciated by an employer. The winsome devotion of a godly wife in a difficult marriage. The sacrifice of personal resources for the advance of the gospel, giving to others to meet a pressing need. Just think about our corporate gathering here this morning. We stood when the scriptures were read. Did you stand with a heart of reverence? Of a desire to listen so as to heed? Were you captivated as the scriptures were read by the very voice of God? We sang out loud songs of praise to God. Did you actually intend the words that you sang? Were you distracted? Did you want to impress others in an outward form of worship? Did we mouth words so that others wouldn't know that inwardly we don't love God at all? We came to the Lord's table. Remember the death of Christ and his soon return. Did we go through motions? Or did we examine our hearts, grieve over sin, rejoice over forgiveness purchased by the cross of Christ? And Sunday morning gatherings at church are perhaps where worship seems most apparent. It's visible. But again, outward appearances don't tell the story that God sees. Kids, would your mom or dad be pleased if your room got cleaned with a bad attitude? Bitterness, grumbling, complaining, dragging your feet, whining, talking back, delaying, throwing things around. Of course they wouldn't. It's not as if your parents had you just so they could experience the benefits of a clean room in that strange wing in the other side of the house. No, they're concerned about you. What do they want from you in the go clean your room moment? What would be pleasing to mom and dad? Yeah, mom, what a great idea. I want to help around the house because I love this family. What would it mean to clean your room to please the Lord? 
Theologians call what we find here in 2 Corinthians 5.10 the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. This is a judgment for believers only. Unbelievers will never be rewarded for doing good. We know this on a couple of accounts. Uh, They don't show up at the judgments where rewards are dispensed. And secondly, we know that there is no one who does good, not even one. Romans chapter 3. Outside of Christ, you can't possibly do what God deems good. Those things which He alone can produce in the heart working out into a life. And while it's true that humans can do lesser bad things in a relative sense than other times, there, there is a sense of moral relative good. But we're not all as bad as we could be. None of us are as bad as our potential. That's a restraining grace of the Lord. But nobody can truly do those things which meet God's standard for love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Apart from the Spirit's work. Apart from faith in Christ. Without faith it is impossible to what? Please God. So unbelievers will not be at this assessment. They they can't possibly be rewarded for doing good. This is a judgment of rewards. Rewards gained and forfeited. This, by the way, is not a judgment about sin. Romans 8, 1 is clear. All who are in Christ, it is true, uh, for them there is no condemnation. If you are in Christ, it means that you belong to Him. A surrendered life to Him in faith means that your sins, past, present, and future, have been wiped away, removed as far as the east is from the west. God has called that which is scarlet white as snow. The Christian is justified, declared to be righteous, called godly, set apart as a saint. That's true for everyone who has expressed simple faith in Jesus Christ, surrendered to a life in Him. So this is not a judgment for sin. But it's not unrelated to sin. You notice that good and bad are listed here. What does that mean? When you and I sin, our sins are forgiven in Christ, and yet we have evaporated opportunity for reward. Wasted time, squandered opportunity... Ruined relationships, all of those create a vacuum, an empty space where there could have been fruitful obedience leading to reward. It's a loss of forfeiture. And a tragic one. I want you to turn to a passage that puts a little more of this in some more detail. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The same judgment is described there in the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 10, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. Paul, an apostle, first generation of the church. We don't have apostles today because we don't need a foundation for the building. We're building the 20th floor of the building. We're laboring on top of the foundation that is the New Testament. Paul laid that foundation. Others are building on it. But notice this warning. Each man must be careful how he builds. Each successive generation of the church must be faithful to not lay a different foundation than the New Testament, but to lay upon it the foundation of the New Testament, the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ, and the foundation stones around that are the apostles and New Testament prophets. We build on such things carefully in accord with the plan Verse 11, no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12, if any man builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. Notice the future tense. It's not always evident here. Wood, hay, and straw can look good. We can paint it, cover it up. But the fire... The scrutiny of Jesus' evaluation of how we have lived the Christian life and the building up of his body, the church, will be revealed. Each man's work will be seen for what it is. And the fire itself, that is the scrutiny of the evaluation of Jesus Christ at the Bema Seat Judgment, will test the quality of each man's work. 
And if a man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. Gold, silver, precious stones. And I hope you're thinking right now, wait a second. God, you're going to reward that which withstands the scrutiny of Jesus' evaluative, fiery judgment? Wait, the only thing that could withstand that scrutiny is stuff you produce. Well, that's right. And God is going to reward that which he alone can produce in the life of a believer. And you say, well, that's not fair. Yeah, lots of the Christian life isn't fair. <laughs> that Christ would get our sin and we get his righteousness. That the guilty go free while the infinitely innocent one suffered under the just judgment of God. And reward for things we could never in and of ourselves produce. What does Ephesians 2.10 say? God prepared in advance that we would walk in good works. Saved by grace through faith, walking in the good works that he prepared for us in advance. This is the Christian life. The Christian life is rewarded for its works. If any man's work is burned up, verse 15, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. That wood, hay, and stubble. I, I used to think, oh man, I, I brought all this stuff with me to the throne room of heaven and, and there it goes up in smoke. Oh, what a bummer. Friends, that will not be a bummer to see the wood, hay, and stubble. The mixed motives, the residue of our depravity, the manipulations, the, the bad ideas, the building on the foundation with the wrong stuff or in the wrong way or at the wrong time, self-aggrandizement, the wanting other people to pat me on the back and give human applause for the things that I supposedly do for Christ. All that stuff gets eradicated by the scrutiny of the fire of Jesus' judgment. And praise God it does. When we get to heaven, we will not be saying, can I bring this wagon of garbage in here with me? We'll say, praise God, Whew, that stuff's gone. And God will reward what remains. Why? Because he's a good God, extravagantly, extravagantly giving lavish gifts to the undeserving. This is a testimony of God's grace upon grace because he gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. He's not giving to us because he owes us as if we earned something. He's rewarding that which he produces. And when we yield to God's spirit in a life of faith and obedience, the spirit of God produces in and through us things that God himself desires to reward. It's a remarkably unfair equation. You know, we never get back time. We never get back those opportunities afforded us. So Paul says we live now to please him. Christian, make this your goal, to be pleasing to Christ. Well, we have to look at a couple other texts to look at another judgment. This is a point of man to die once and then to face judgment. This is true for everybody, not just believers, although believers and unbelievers will face different judgments. Turn to Luke chapter 12. If you're here this morning and you don't yet know Christ, I am so thankful that you were here hearing about Christ, hearing about how short life is, hopefully getting a glimpse of how long eternity is and that what you do here matters for eternity. Look at Luke 12, beginning in verse 42. Jesus has just told his disciples a couple of quick parables. Be ready. The master of the wedding feast is coming back, so you who are serving him, make sure you're doing the right things. And another parable. If a homeowner knew when the robber was coming, he probably would have prepared. But you don't know when he's coming, so be ready. And Peter said, Lord, verse 41, are you addressing this to us or to everyone else as well? And Jesus' answer is, wonderfully ambiguous. He asks the question, who then is the sensible steward? In other words, you knucklehead disciples aren't off the hook here. And this question goes out to everybody. 
Everybody be, ought to be asking, am I a sensible steward? Am I sensibly responsible with my life and the time and the opportunities and the resources that God has given to me and placed under my care? Am I dealing faithfully? Who is the faithful and sensible steward, Jesus asked, whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them rations at the proper time? Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. This is the faithful in little things here. Get to be faithful with many things there. Notice the turn in verse 45. But if that slave says in his heart, my master's a long time in coming. And he begins to beat the slaves, the men and the women, to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know, and he will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accordance with his will will receive many lashes, and the one who did not know and committed deeds worthy of flogging will receive few. From everyone who has been given much, much is required, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask the more. Verses 42 to 44 deals with the evaluation of faithful slaves. 45 and following deals with unbelievers. And notice you have unfaithful servants of God entrusted with his things that knew his will and are still assigned a place with unbelievers. That means belief and unbelief aren't just categories of, oh yeah, I think there's a God. No, belief and unbelief go much deeper than that. I yield to the God I know exists. I take him at his word. That's belief. And so the unfaithful slave who knew what God said and said, forget about it, he's not coming for a long time, I'm going to do what I want, is considered an unbeliever and cast into the lake of fire. Friends, you need to know that Jesus is coming back. And whether you see him when he arrives back here on the earth or whether you fall into the leg of a stegosaurus and meet him a little sooner than that, you will meet Christ. And you will have to give account for your life. There's a first application for this passage. What did Paul have in mind primarily as he was writing this letter to the Corinthians? He wanted Corinthian believers to understand him. They had misunderstood him. They had misjudged Paul. They had viewed him from outward appearances. They compared him to better speakers in their mind. They wanted him to entertain like the people that they got used to paying to entertain them. They accused him of all kinds of things. They had a wrong view of Paul. Paul wants the Corinthian believers to understand him. What are my goals in life? I'm not going after the fancy tricks you're attracted to. Anybody could train to do those things. I'm here with a different purpose and a different way of living. My goal in life is to please Christ. Paul wanted the Corinthian believers to know his true motives and to stop looking at outward appearances. The second application here is that I believe Paul wanted the Corinthian believers to imitate his own example, that they would grow out of their immaturities, that they would stop being carnal, fleshly, worldly in their thinking but think with an eternal perspective and heaven's eyes. And I think Paul has in mind for all believers in this passage a timely reminder. We're not yet home. And while we live in this vulnerable tent that will soon be torn down, take care. Take care that we're not glamping working as hard as we can to make it our ambition in life to make this life as long-lasting and comfortable and fun as possible. But to be ready to meet Christ, having lived a life pleasing to Him. Is that your goal this morning? To be pleasing to Him. We're not good at this. Think about my own life from the time I woke up this morning until this moment. If I could put percentages on the purity of devotion to Christ between the time I woke up to the moment we're talking together here now. 
all of my life pleasing to the Lord. Some pure, unmixed, clean, heaven-worthy life? Of course not. And we think about the totality of our earthly existence and how hard it is to live just a life thinking about God in each moment and living for Him well, moment by moment. If you're rattled here this morning, you're, you're in good company. The rest of us are, I believe, rattled by this passage. What does it mean to make our aim something that we can't do perfectly, and if we're honest with ourselves, we don't do well? It means to live a life of utter dependence on the Lord. Lord, I need you. There I was again, thinking about myself, wanting a pat on the back. There I was doing the outwardly right things for the wrong reasons, and there I was again just doing the wrong things for the wrong reasons. God help us. This text, this imitable quality in Paul as an aim, sets something for us that we ought to be aiming at. God seeks worshipers in spirit and in truth. The kind of worshiper the Father sent the Son to purchase and redeem with His own blood. Uh, the kind of worship that is laid out for us in Romans 12.1, the all of life, 24-7, 365, living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Him. And God sees. God sees when you're battling sin at the heart level, depending on Him for strength to say no to temptation, led by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. Know this, Christian, your tears are kept in His bottle. Your prayers have risen to the golden bowl of incense in the throne room of God in heaven with the sincere prayers of all believers of all time. Your love for other believers, whether recognized or totally ignored, misunderstood or maligned like Paul's were, that is seen in heaven and will be rewarded on the day of judgment. Jesus said in some practical care for precious followers that will follow him at great cost during the great tribulation, he said, what you have done for the least of my brethren, you have done for me. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, do not go on passing judgment before the time. Wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness, disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. We can wait for the final outcomes on these things. We can trust the Lord with them. What about God's investment in you? Will he have a return? What about your investment in eternal things? Will you get a return? Yes, far more than you could calculate. Talents, time, opportunities, relationships here are multiplied and magnified in reward in heaven. How well are you stewarding God's resources knowing that nothing good in you or through you was ever ultimately yours. Nothing good or enjoyable that God has given to you came from you. How is your heart in that stewardship? Grateful? Privileged? Counted a joy in prosperity? Counted a joy to serve Christ in poverty? Did you complain about circumstances, people, trials? Are you eager to employ each opportunity as a venue for pleasing Christ? God will be faithful to get glory for himself. God knows the invisible things of the heart. And God sustains his saints. He has prepared good things in advance for us to walk in. He will uphold you by his righteous right hand. Bring you safely home and reward you for the things he has produced. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is our ambition to make it our ambition, to follow Paul's ambition, to be pleasing to you. When we think about our own thought life, motives, outward deeds, all of it, we recognize it. it's challenging just to say, yeah, I want to please Christ all the time. We know how far short we fall. We thank you for your sustaining grace, for the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, 
for your faithfulness to your own promises. God, would it be ever more true of us with each passing day that we would seek to please you in all things. We pray it in Christ's name.